Well, it's 202, so we'll go ahead and start start the webinar. I see we got some participants. Want to go ahead and let those guys in? Um, and um, I'm really excited about today's webinar because um, of all the pinnacle preferred providers, the guys who have probably worked with the most customers of anyone there and who I've heard the most reviews about are Heidi and Brett. And so, and their company called, Pro, um, I'm sorry, guys, Process Optimizer. <laughs> the allergies are getting me. And um, talk to them numerous times, talk to numerous coaches. And to give everyone a little background about Pinnacle, Pinnacle is a high level business coaching group that um, really very impressed with the level of coaches. A lot of these guys are dealing with significantly larger companies. A lot of these guys are dealing with, um, like I know you guys work closely with Michael Erath, and he's he's known as national coach. Um, really does a great job. Uh, Greg Cleary, all all those guys who are who are known in the coaching world for high level coaching, and they always talk about the playbook, right? And it was interesting. I know Josh probably sent you an email. I just got an email this week from an accounting coach, and he was talking about how important it was to document the processes. But the fourth thing he said, the most important step he says is don't do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm going to share that email with everyone. If, if I ask you if you had time, I'll share that email because this guy has really got a really good following, probably about, I would say, over a thousand accounting firms. And that was his step number four was, you know, these are the important things to do when you do your uh, playbook. And step number four is don't do it yourself. Hire someone to help you with it. And that's what your company does. So I'm going to let you guys take away and um, talk about uh, your company and your qualifications and then we'll start your presentation. All right. Thanks, Mike. So Process Optimizer was born about seven years ago. Heidi was an executive vice president at P.F. Chang's. Um, she was on the leadership team. That was a billion dollar environment. And that's really when the process bug bit Heidi. She was doing a lot of process work for the company. And in fact, we share a story with all of our new clients. We always say, let's find the green bell pepper moment for you. And here's what we're referring to. Heidi discovered a better way to prep green bell peppers. Now, at that time, there was over 300 concepts each store each location is prepping 35 pounds of green bell peppers and if you change the way you make the first four cuts you save about hundred and ninety thousand dollars annually just by making that process change and when you think about that that's just one process one ingredient so when private equity bought out pf chang's Heidi immediately jumped on the coach bandwagon. We both read Traction, got real excited, but she realized, along with Michael Erath, very early on, the process piece was missing and that it was a very difficult do-it-yourself. So process optimizer was born. So our approach to this is we produce process playbooks in nine days. The cornerstone of the offering is a two-day workshop, which is highly productive, lots of aha moments. And then we provide a full year of accountability coaching to keep our clients accountable to the rollout process. So you truly move from process documentation to process optimization so that process becomes a wonderful cultural day-to-day -day, living, breathing way of doing business. So the one thing we share with people is, especially our visionaries, we say, refrain from viewing process as an event. View process as something that you bring into the organization. It becomes fruitful. It's intuitive. It, it really has a lot to do with training and onboarding and your customer experience and the way we go. So that's how our company was born. We now have Heidi plus four certified process optimizers. The backbone of our business is coaches. We receive significant referrals from coaches and our best outcomes are from well-coached companies. So we have, as Mike mentioned, fantastic loyal coaches in the Pinnacle Group, in the EOS space, in scaling up and these other operating systems because they realize they get their clients farther up the mountain, faster, happier with process 
playbooks in hand. So that's our model. And uh, today, Heidi's going to take us through a, uh, a presentation that talks about documentation and the move to optimization and to get you all thinking about um, kind of how process needs to have a place at your table. It deserves a place at the leadership table. So, Heidi? Right. If I could say one thing real quick, you just brought up a very powerful point. A lot of people are like, oh, yes, I got to document my processes. I got to do that. I do that. But they don't realize that the end goal is the optimization of it, really. And it that is where the process pays for itself. Because a lot of times, I mean, there's the old joke about the grandmother or the daughter that saw the grandmother always cutting the ends off the ham. And it's like, mom, why do you always do that? Well, I don't know. Ask your grandmother. Oh, I don't know. Ask your great-grandmother. And the great-grandmother said, well, the oven wasn't big enough, so we had to cut the ends off the ham and to get it to fit in the oven. So a lot of times when you document it, you can actually see the steps that can be eliminated. And that's where the magic becomes. That's where people have really increased their productivity 30 40 50% just by documenting and realizing that some of these processes are outdated or can be automated or can be eliminated, right? So, so anyway. Yeah, and Mike, to play on that, uh, we are told by our clients because we conduct real extensive debriefs at the end of the workshop and also during the engagement. And they tell us that the payback is easily three times to 10 times in the first 12 months. It's truly remarkable. And so many of these come through this optimization process. Again, it's that green bell pepper uh, moment. That was only one ingredient. Imagine if you could clear up, clean up the gaps, the handoffs, and the customer experience with all of the ingredients, how much better your business would be. So you're, you're spot on. And when we hear, oh, well, that's always the way we've been doing it, we just smile and ask some more questions so that we can really help some people, right? Awesome. Exactly. Okay, Heidi, I, I'm sorry for interrupting. Please, please start. Oh. Sure. So... The first thing I'd like to challenge all of you to do, and this is a fun exercise you can do with your teams, is have your team get together in a room. Uh, they can be either a functional team or the leadership team or the sales team, and you're going to have them build a snowflake. And you're going to have, each person's going to have an eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper. They're going to close their eyes and you're going to give them instructions on how to build a snowflake. It's simply fold your paper in half, tear off a corner, fold it in half again, tear off another corner. You repeat this four times so they've, they've torn off a total of four corners and folded the paper four times. Then have everybody open their eyes and hold their papers up and you will see snowflakes. No one will be the same. And the, the comment or the facilitation point to this exercise is this is what your customer is experiencing. Depending on who they're interacting with, it's a slightly different experience. No one can put their, their thumb on it and say exactly what's different, but it's slightly different. And in some cases it could be a whole lot different. And that's the beauty of process, right? We're trying to get to that consistent experience from your customer perspective whether it's an internal or external customer. So again, just perform that simple exercise with your team and have them go through the folds and open up and see that they will get different snowflakes with the same instruction. So that speaks to that consistent process has several components to it, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. Awesome. So we have an assessment that uh, Josh is gonna put up for you all to answer some questions to see where you're at with your core processes. So if you wanna take a minute or two to scroll through those questions, just uh, identify immediately what comes to mind. Don't waste a whole lot of brain cells. And then we'll talk about that later on in the presentation. So continuing along in our conversation, we've taken um, the time to quantify, and Mike spoke to this, this briefly a few minutes ago, what happens uh, for inefficient 
or lacking processes in companies. And Brett also mentioned this. We see a, a three to 10 times return on the investment in our workshop because of the issues that are people and process related that, that you all are facing today. Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. are employee turnover, customer dissatisfaction, lack of repeat business, and you're wasting resources, both time and money. And we've seen that add up to 10 to 15 basis points on your bottom line in the course of a year. So I have something to add to that. We are often asked, you know, what is the ideal size of company or the industry who needs this? And it's interesting because in our experience, we can point to fantastic million dollar eight employee companies who have benefited from process work. We can point to 500 million, 600 million, 600 employee companies who have benefited. The only real difference is the bigger companies realize a significant return faster, especially in waste and handoffs. And so the other thing to remember is whatever your business, you can benefit from processes. We often are asked, well, do you have any specialties? Well, we don't. You know, the, the, there's a lot of businesses that just beg for processes, contracting, for example, healthcare, um, certain other service industries. But you'd be surprised, we've worked in gaming. We have worked in lots of different specialty boutique businesses that are smaller that see significant gains because they clean up these four bullet points that we that we see here. And I think the other thing to pull out of this is sometimes when we do a presentation or excuse me, a workshop, people feel like, oh my gosh, are we now getting all these guardrails on ourselves? No, no, no. Process documentation and optimization actually opens the door for extraordinary experiences, for extraordinary outstanding customer service, because you develop this consistency. And we see this because employees tell us this at the end of the workshop, they become the best process champions because of these reasons right here. They see the instant improvement and how much better things are. Right. And and I, I would actually almost argue a little with you. I would say the smaller companies probably could get their payback quicker. It's just really, I mean, because when you think about today's economy and you think about the cost of labor, like there's a tightening in the margins right now. Labor's gotten a lot more expensive. And you think of all the the churn too, when you lose employees because of frustration with documented processes, not knowing what they're doing, a lack of training, all the little things over a course of time that, um, you know, the small businesses always, you know, the number one thing holding all small businesses back, and I'd say businesses less than 5 million, I think is bottlenecks created by the owner. You know, the owner's always the <laughs> bottleneck and, and, and it's usually the processes and the systems that the owner, you know, refuses to document. And I'm, I'm actually preaching to, to myself a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Being a classic visionary person, so to think is, but clearly it clearly is. I mean, um, one of those one of those things. So I, I think, like you said, the smaller business, you know, uh, of course, you got to be able to pay for it. It's not that big of an investment, but I think the bigger to pay back, especially in today's environment where labor is so expensive and you, and and it's it's a, it's a commodity that people are really. You've got to keep, you've got to be, have a new mindset of dealing with your employees. Oh, you just don't like that too bad is not an answer, right? It's not an answer because now there's recruiters out there to take all your employees <laughs> and, and, you know, the grass is always green on the other side. With that said, I'll let, go ahead, Heidi. Perfect. Thank you. So one of the keys to our workshops is we're going to engage your employees. That is the people doing the work. And it never fails to amaze leadership teams that as we probe and ask questions, if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. And that becomes very clear. Employees may, may understand certain steps, but they may not be able to articulate the whole. Uh, and Deming was this quality and process guru, and I love this quote, because if you can't describe it, you really don't know what you're doing. So when we talk about creating core processes, we've got 
uh, five steps. You can see them on screen. You know, we first identify them, then we document them, then we test them. Then we get that accountability piece after we train our employees. And then we get into this continuous improvement cycle that Mike talked about early on. You know, do we automate? Do we eliminate? Um, do we enhance? What are their opportunities? But you've got to start somewhere. And we always say better not perfect. Let's get them documented. Then we can start that continuous improvement cycle through measurements. And we'll talk about scorecards too. So we get lots of questions about process, policy, and procedures. So put together this little slide to talk about the difference between the three. So if you think about processes, your foundation, those are these high level steps you wanna to follow to deliver an outcome. And if I've got any builders out there, you gotta build your foundation first. So that's what we preach. Got to build your playbooks first. Then you need to work on your procedures, which are those how-to documents. Those are those really nice screenshots, training videos, uh, checklists. These can be all the how-to that align with these high-level steps. And then you may have policies which mandate execution of the process if there's very specific uh, ways that you need things done. So that's the difference between process, policy, and procedure, just to level set everyone's expectation. So what we're talking about are process or playbooks. We're going to build that foundation, starting with those high-level steps after we identify what the outcome or desired end state is for the particular process. Okay. So as we identify processes, you know, typical ones, just to get you started thinking, marketing, sales, human resources, finance, customer service, or your customer experience, and operations. We either use your accountability chart, your functional accountability chart, or your issues list to identify, okay, what's core to your business? What are the key playbooks? If you think about your business as a funnel, how do we get leads in? How do we convert it to dollars out the bottom? And then what are the supporting infrastructure teams that we also have on the business? And that helps you identify what should your process playbooks be for your particular business. Then you get to this documenting piece. This is this high level. Again, we want high level steps that deliver an outcome for an individual process, which typically is aligned with a function on your functional accountability chart. 20% to get you 80%. Think both visual and verbal as you're documenting and engaging your employees, which is what we do in these workshops. We have the leadership team, and Brett uses the word witness these workshops, and it's the employees that are doing the work that we're extracting and getting the documentation from in order to document your playbooks. So, so one of the things we hear from clients, and we're hearing it a lot, we're hearing it a lot recently in Canada, uh, interestingly, where uh, they are having more and more employees retire. And so this harvesting of all of this intellectual property is so important. Um, Heidi was in Toronto several weeks ago working with a manufacturer. And interestingly, they had some fantastic employees, lots of tenure, but nobody had ever captured what it is they're doing. And when this came out in the workshop, this was critical. The leadership team, it's almost like they were frightened because they realized, oh my goodness, had we not done this and they left or something happened, we lose this huge, huge body of knowledge. So that's the other foundational aspect to employee engagement. When employees are asked in the right environment, that's why the, our workshop is effective, they will contribute and they will tell you things that you might not have thought about or you certainly might not have thought about them in context. So this, again, 20% that get, generates 80% of the results and then seeing this participation as a contributing part is really revealing. We love to hear the stories about, I always refer to them as the hard-handed stoic workers out there who don't say much, but who touch clients. And we see this in contracting again a lot, how they will come to a workshop environment and really contribute. And their contributions make significant improvements 
in the playbooks of the company. Uh, but it, again, it's important to take the time to ask them and they feel safe enough to contribute. If you can, if you can find a way to do that, boy, you can really, really reap some fantastic results. Awesome. So when we talk about process flow diagrams, we're addressing both visual and verbal learners. So we've got words and we've got pictures to help us identify what the process is. Deming, another great quote, I'm a Deming fan, if you can't tell, a bad process will beat a good person every time. Let that sink in. A bad process will beat a good person every time. Think to your own businesses and teams. Do you have any bad processes that are causing good people to leave or to get really frustrated? So what we're going to talk about is what's happening in the middle, the reality, and that little offshoot arrow that you see in the center flow diagram. That's called what we call a workaround. That's when your teammates get out band-aids and duct tape and just get things done. And they continue to get things done that way with more band-aids and duct tape until we ask them and surface, hey, wait a minute, why do we have all this band-aids and duct tape? You know, and, th and that's how they're training your new employees too with the band-aids and duct tape. So if you don't break that cycle, you're going to get in that never-ending loop of, well, we've always done it this way. And then you don't understand why we had to do it that way initially, which may or may not be relevant today in terms of the process and the playbook that we need to follow. And we're getting towards that on the right-hand side, future state, better, not perfect, because you will get into a continuous improvement cycle and your business will change and grow and your process playbooks will need to change and grow as you grow as well. The last statement on the page is without data, all you have is an opinion. We are going to be talking about measurables and scorecards because without data, all you have is an opinion. We can't solve problems with opinions. We can solve problems with data. A good quote. <laughs> <laughs> so getting into that, using scorecards to manage process and performance, when we talk about uh, identifying processes, we're going to identify how and what leading indicators we have for that process that tell us sooner rather than later that the process is going to go off track. We've all got financial reports. They're lagging. They're good. But they're lagging. They're not actionable today. So we're going to try and associate with each process the relevant measurables for those. So we're going to allow you through your scorecards to manage not only results, but manage the process as well. And we're going to, again, get your team involved by identifying that 20% that gets you 80%, those high level steps. Then we can take a step back and look at, okay, what are those key numbers that we need to be paying attention to that are the early warning indicators that will predict that we're going to have a problem with this process sooner rather than later, rather than when the books are closed at the end of the month or the end of the quarter, and then try and action something at that point in time, in which case there's a whole lot of water that's, that's flowed under the bridge by that point in time. So again, we want to use scorecards because without data, all you have is an opinion. This is really so something good. to add Forget to that. Oh, this go ahead. is really sorry, good. Mike. This is really good. I have to send a note to one of my team members on what, one of the things you said. It just made me, you're really bringing out a bunch of stuff. <laughs> That's good. So uh, forgive so, me. I was about to flip over the screen. My attention <laughs> deficit kicked in and I was like, whoa, wait a second. I'm in the middle of a webinar. So I will send a team's message. Okay. While you guys keep on going, this is really good though. <laughs> so, so one other question you can ask yourself about scorecards is this. Ask yourself, does, do our scorecards have a predictive quality. So when Heidi talks about leading indicators, we regularly see great teams, good companies, profitable companies, but their scorecards do not reflect accurate processes and desired behaviors. Sometimes they're counting things that really don't give them a leading indicator. 
So it's not uncommon for us during a workshop, somebody will go, oh my gosh, we've been counting A, B, and C in this process. We shouldn't count that. We need to count X, Y, and Z. Those are the three things that are going to tell us when this is going to run off the rails. And when you have predictive scorecards and you push them down to the lowest level and the behaviors become aligned, you really empower people. And this is a gift to management because it's easier to manage. Speaking as a lifelong business developer, it's so much easier as a business developer if I know how many discovery calls I need to have in a day, in a week, in a month, how many contacts, how many cold calls, whatever the metrics is, if I know that, we don't have to get the opinions and the emotion out. We can manage to those metrics. And what we find is that scorecards just leap off the page when we document good processes and they're intuitive. The why is delivered. We hear, we hear leaders all the time go, oh my goodness, now I know why. I didn't really understand the why. And it's because the behaviors, the scorecard, the leading indicators are aligned. And that is very powerful and remarkably simple if, if it's done correctly. And it really allows teams and, and companies to, to see how their functional accountability chart ties to process, which ties to results. So they're all interconnected. They're not isolated boxes that we have to work on. It's all a, a cohesive system that works together. And everything that we just talked about should have a seat at the table as opposed to, oh my gosh, this is just something I have to check and I'm done. And once they're printed and pretty, they're going to sit on a bookshelf and collect dust, but I documented them. They're done. You have to think about them as a living, breathing connection to your scorecards, your accountability chart, and the processes, your playbooks. So if you took the assessment, um, if you want to enter your score, or we can um, figure out what those scores are, Josh. And we'll talk about them later. Oh, okay, cool. And that's so, not oh. including my survey. Hmm. <laughs> I'll send you my score individually. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. You'll be you'll be staying after school. <laughs> staying after school. So we'll revisit the the scores in a couple of minutes here. So then we get on to this phase called testing. So we've identified them, we've documented them. Now, now we're gonna test them. And what this step shows is that it, it shows to the users and the employees, hey, we've captured the right high level steps to deliver our desired outcome. We're all aligned on what that outcome is. We're all aligned on what those high level steps are. Now we're gonna try it with your real world, actual products and services with the employees, that we're engaged and are doing the work to make sure that, okay, we've got the right high level steps. Then at that point in time, as you're testing is a good time to identify what are those critical sub processes or procedures or how to instructions and what's the right format. We all learn differently. And if you think about different positions, different functions in your organization, what's the best way to train someone for how to. It could be for like accounting types, very visual. So screenshots may be very effective because it's, it's very precise system inputs that have to be done in a certain order. Then you may have someone on your manufacturing floor where they need a quick video how to instruction, how to set up a particular machine. And that's best accomplished by a 30 second video Again, engage those employees, have them take the video. You accomplish two things. You've got built-in trainers and you'll get better quality documentation that people will use because it's been built by actually people that are using it. So this testing is a very critical step that's part of the whole process playbook creation and documentation and then getting to that holding people accountable piece. So some of the, the processes, and this is an example um, of a procedure, a, a standard operating procedure that we used at PF Chang's, we accomplished both, both visual and verbal styles of learning. We also accomplished uh, handling any language barriers by including a lot of pictures. So you wanna talk about content, what the step is, what's going to, what 
um, is going to happen. What's that how to? What's the sequence? These are in the order that we do things in. Timing is how long it takes the average person to do it. And when you go back to measurables, it's a great um, individual number to have because who wants to be average? And we were very deliberate about the words that we used when we talked about an average person in terms of what the measurable or metric was for this given standard operating procedure. And then the desired end state. What's our end result look like? What does mm -hmm. good look like? What does done look like? So when you talk about these procedures and the high level processes, you need these to get to continuous improvement through eliminating the noise caused by everyone doing it differently. Think about your snowflake. It's that noise that's caused by everyone doing it differently that's inhibiting us from producing that consistent result from our customer perspective. So we need that process. They're not constraining. They're not meant to be micromanaging. They're meant to inform the why we do it and the how we do it. And then, and then if there's any policies that we need to follow when we're executing the work. Any thoughts there, Mike, before I go on? Uh, no, I, I just think that's um, pretty clear. Pretty and and actually doing then we get it on is, to the is the hard part, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So now we've got them documented. We need to get to that followed by all holding people accountable, and that's through training, right? We need to make sure everyone is trained, make sure they agree to follow the process, and then use our scorecards because remember we will have identified measurables for the process ideally leading indicators, maybe some compliance measurables as well for processes. Then we get this consistency and stability piece. It's easier to train. It's a whole lot more fun and we're going to drive results. And this, this is a challenging piece. This is why we want you to use your employees that are doing the work because then you've got these built-in process champions. You've got built-in process trainers and you've got built-in process advocates by engaging those employees doing doing the work as we went through that identification, documentation, and testing phases. So I'm reminded of a, a process experience I had many years ago as a young man where we were, we were stuck in the organization. We had to have an outside person come in and, and put the fix on this. And it was relatively simple and it was process driven. And what happened was, because we were involved, the different groups, it was, a, it was an engineering group and a sales and marketing group. And because we had input into this thing, because we had a voice, we owned it and we became the champions of it. So I often hear Heidi say, your employees are gonna run with this because if, if, if they're involved in building the thing, they're gonna understand the why. And the, the real victory as a leader is when you hear people say, oh, we do it like this, let me show you. And oh, we need a checklist here. Here's where the checklist belongs, oh my gosh. Now they're owning it, they're running with it. And so I'm reminded of a, a great mentor and, and, and man who helped me in my younger days so much. He said, Brett, there's nothing quite as important as someone else's idea. And it took me about 10 years to figure out what he was saying to me because he mentored me and loved me and trusted me so much that I didn't, it took me years to realize a lot of the initiatives in running this man's business that I took on were his ideas, but he allowed them to be thought of as mine because he, he, he let me participate. And so when you bring your employees into this, this followed by all peace gets a lot easier. We talk to employees, to great companies sometimes that are having a problem with this process piece. And we say, do you have, do you have playbooks? Oh yeah, they're up there on the shelf. Do you use them? Well, no. Well, who put them together? Well, you know, I did. I took several months and went through this and got the input. There they are. They're up on the shelf, but nobody uses them. And nobody will ever use anything like that unless they have a voice in it. And then it becomes part of the followed by all. So it's, 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 it's on the one hand, it's remarkably easy to avoid that pitfall, but we hear this week after week after week. Please come in, help us because we've fallen into this trap. And, and I, we should also point out the tendency on most companies, and it's well-intentioned, is to document everything. And Heidi will tell you as a lean expert, that's exactly, precisely what you don't do. 
You do not document all the exceptions. Better not perfect. The 20% gets you 80%. Get everybody on board. Then it's go time. Right. And use your scorecards to manage exceptions. Yes. You really need to stop and understand, okay, what's causing the exception rather than let's create a process to handle it. Let's understand why we have so many exceptions. I was working with a client earlier this year. They were a subcontractor and their special orders, much to the surprise of the leadership team, had grown to over 50% of their orders. They were no longer special. They were the norm. Right, and they right. didn't have a measurable on a scorecard around special orders and maybe that they should be in that less than 10% range. I'd probably argue that they should be less than 5% if they're really special. But they've allowed customers to drive this specialness. And there were, it was crippling a couple of teams' processes because they kept having to manage all of these hmm. exceptions. Again, put it on a scorecard. Let's understand why, what's causing our, our customers to do this. And are they our ideal customers? Do we need to change who we're marketing to? Do we need, you know, it, it can force a whole lot of uh, questions and great discussion by having it appear on a scorecard tied to a process. Then once we've got through that, we get into this repetitive continuous improvement cycle of at least annually, again, can't set them on a shelf and forget them. We're going to review and update, see if there's opportunities to automate, eliminate, again, engage your employees, use your scorecards, you know, use your functional accountability chart to drive and guide your improvement and enhancement of processes. You can really listen to employees and really hear, okay, this is causing us a lot of extra work. When they start talking about, well, we need to create a Google Doc or we need to have a smart sheet and start working outside of your system, mm -hmm. then that's your key that, hey, wait a minute, something in the system isn't working as designed as part of the process. They're having to get out that workaround in that smart sheet or Google Doc or Band-Aids or duct tape, we need to understand why, what's going on with the system, what's changed. And, and this is the cycle which starts employee dissatisfaction, frustration, wearing people out, the recruiter calls and they leave. So we, you know, we didn't, for years, we didn't really wave the, the HR onboarding, better hiring flag very much. But interestingly, great processes instantly improve onboarding, training, employee retention, all of that stuff. It just, it's remarkable how they have this direct impact because this whole, like Heidi described this special order thing, it's, it's the stuff that wears people out. It's the stuff that sends them home and they tell their spouse, this place is killing me. I'm just worn out. And it, it's the lack of a process. And we see this, you know, in good companies, smart people, uh, but they just don't have their processes in place and, and it, it's risky, to say the least, when a good process will, will just really, really add so much improvement to all of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And companies are making great money without process, but they're, they're going to start to have those little cracks in the foundation, either people leaving, customers leaving, and without stopping to pause and say, hey, do we have processes aligned with our accountability, our functions, and our scorecards to deliver those consistent results to our customers, then you can start to see how they can grow and scale from there. Right. I, I think what you say, companies will, will make money, they'll grow profit, but eventually you're going to hit a wall, yeah. period. And, and, so, and then you get into the churn where your growth, you're picking up customers, but you're losing some customers and different things like that. And you'll see that, you know, um, you just have to actually systemize your business and, and sort of, you know, get stop being the bottleneck in it. But a lot of times, like you said, owners don't realize that, you know. Yep. And the exception is is like the killer. Right. And it's interesting. Um, our next slide is what we hear from our clients. I hear, we hear from a lot of visionaries that, I mean, this is torture for a visionary to sit through this for two days. 
We wear people out during these sessions, but visionaries are generally the first to speak up to say, oh my gosh, we so needed this. This is so not my wheelhouse. I've been, you know, the root cause of some of our problems. This doesn't mean the end of the world. It'll actually allow me to be more of a visionary and, and just get on with, with the growth and, and potential that this business has. So we hear about uh, this importance of scorecards and measurables, you know, easier to prioritize and work on the, the how-to documents, those procedures. We talk a lot about triggers and handoffs, the beginning and end of a process. It's amazing as you're working with employees doing the work that they're not clear what the start or the end of their process is. One Again, question. Sure. What does FBA stand for? Followed by all. Sorry. Um, I used a um, TLA, uh, a three-letter acronym. Uh, so what, what are some examples? I know we talk about, I talk about scorecards a lot, but what are some examples of some practical scorecards for track, for system, some real, real life examples that you guys have used in the past to sort of, and then, um, because when I think of systems, it's it's hard. I always think of the output. Like we do a lot of tax work, so you know, my our scorecard would be, hey, how many returns are completed, or you know, um, but what would be a, a scorecard for us? Some examples of some scorecards. Sure. So sales, as Brett was alluding to, or business development's an easy one that most people can can grab a hold of. We can measure outcomes or lagging indicators. You know, sales dollars sold number of accounts closed or number of contracts signed. But what we're really looking at through the process steps is your sales cycle. So we're trying to understand, are you getting a lead handed off from marketing, let's say, mm -hmm. and are you going through a qualification stage? So then it would be how many leads are you qualifying? How okay. many calls are you making? Because that could be the next step where we expect you if you've qualify them through an initial filter, have you been able to contact them? How many do you need to do of those a week? How many beyond that, if our next step is creating a presentation and delivering that presentations, how many presentations do you have to deliver? And you're going to start to gather the data around, okay, we need 100 leads for marketing, we'll qualify 75 of them, I'll be able to make 50 calls, I'll be able to do 25 presentations. I'll be able to do provide samples or proposals to uh, 10 of them, and I'm going to close two. So by the time we get to close, we're going to know that that cycle times about eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, but we can start measuring those calls and those contacts and those meetings so that we've got an eight week head start on our sales process that we can start asking, hey, wait a minute, we know you need to make 50 calls this week. You've only made 20. That means eight weeks from now, we're not going to have two um, signed contracts. Right. So that's, okay. that's how you're going to use the process to highlight the steps. And then we're going to figure out, okay, what steps can we measure? It doesn't have to be a pretty measurement. It can be, you know, pen and paper or an Excel spreadsheet to see if it tells us something. And here's the other powerful thing, Mike, in the example that Heidi described, we hear clients say this, and I've seen it personally, where they go, oh my gosh, we finally got this thing documented and optimized. Now we can hire to it. Because what's the worst thing that happens? Let's pick on the sales thing again, where you hire somebody and then, they start working, well, I didn't know I had to do all this other stuff. Well, why didn't they know that? You should be, you should be interviewing to that process because you know what the behaviors are, right? And so people become frustrated very quickly in a lot of new opportunities because the behaviors and the expectations weren't covered. Well, it's because they don't have a process in place. So if you know, again, taking Heidi's data that she laid out, all of those steps that lead up to that, you have a real insight on the kind of person you need to hire to accomplish those tasks right. and you match the expectation. So we recommend using these processes during your screening and recruiting process to help filter out because you're gonna start talking about scorecards, you're going to be talking about process, this is how we operate. And if someone doesn't like that environment, they're gonna self-select out very early on and you haven't invested more than 
you know, maybe an HR recruiter's time rather right. than multiple interviews, onboarding, you know, department managers and 90 days, you've eliminated all of that by, by showcasing, hey, we're process driven and we use scorecards. We're going to measure you and, and having people just self-select out if that's not the environment they want to work in. Right. Awesome. So then let's talk about the poll. If you want to pop back up some of the, the feedback that we got um, from the questions, if you tallied up your score as opposed to the individual questions. Um, so it looks like marketing and sales, there's some room for improvement um, for some folks that uh, responded to the questions. Operations, again, some improvement needed. Josh, are you sharing this? Are you, go to, oh, oh, how do I get to the next question? Scroll. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, finance is typically better documented because finance people are typically process people because they have to be in order to get checks cut, employees paid. So there's, there's usually a little more uh, definition there. So that doesn't surprise me that, you know, um, someone said that there's, there's little or no room to improve because we're, we're getting cash in the bank and getting our employees paid somehow. Somewhat defined in terms of this whole 2080 approach. Again, room to improve. One owner clearly identified. No. <laughs> uh, and some opportunity to improve. Uh, clearly defined trigger. Struggling to identify someone identified and fully identified. So it looks like uh, one team has has done some good process work. Uh, bulletproof handoff to each core process. It's amazing how often we hear that we you know we don't know what's being handed off to the end to the next process or the next stage. Mike, one of the things we love hearing, and it happens weekly when I talk to our CPOs or certified process optimizers is people in a workshop, and it's it's great, especially when you hear it from sales, marketing, and ops people, they will go, oh my goodness, I did not realize that when I was my process, I made things miserable for Brett and accounting. They start to see their place and how they fit. And, and this awareness is one of those things they kind of have to learn for themselves. And we like to bring it out in the workshop because when that happens, then everybody gets to thinking in a little different paradigm. Everything shifts and you start to go, okay, because Heidi comes back all the time and says, you know what, in this company and that company, accounting has to unpack everything and then repack it back up mm -hmm. because marketing or sales or operations did not have good handoffs. So that's one of the keys that's accomplished in the workshop. And so at the very least, the process may not be perfect. It certainly isn't perfect yet at the workshop, but everybody understands the why it needs to be handed off correctly. And that's that's a big revelation for, for the entire team. We see week after week after week is just in handoffs. That's one thing my team has done a good job of really correcting me as the sales guy. <laughs> and then, now we actually do hand it off to accounting and we have a step in our sales process to do that. So, but, so but, Mike, I used to give my account, you know, a shoe box, two shoe boxes full of receipts in the old days. I mean, that kind of deal, you know, he, he didn't say much, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not certain it was the best way to do it. Right. For my tax return. Here's a shoe box. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We try to, uh, we don't do those anymore. We do have, I think, one client that uh, he's got a business with us and he <laughs> brings his little, and we're like, we don't need your shoebox. We need you to write down what you did, right? Unless you want to <laughs> pay extra. I mean, I'm showing my age. So basically, but yeah, I used to get a lot of, when I first started my business, that was the typical process. Here's my shoebox. Call me if you have any questions. So, well, uh, definitely, so I, I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Holly. Just a couple. Just a couple more questions here. Um, so it looks like they're part of employee onboarding. They need to be part of onboarding these processes, um, and pretty neutral on training and holding people accountable. So, looks like there's some opportunity with the folks that are that are on the call uh, today to go back and revisit the steps 
and the approach to getting your processes and playbooks documented and holding people accountable after training. Good. Now I know how to run a poll. I feel I feel trained. <laughs> Any closing thoughts, Brett? No, I think I think that the greatest thing we've seen in the in the business world is we have a we have a coach on the East Coast, and he is considered to be uh, in the top five in in his operating system. And he actually has a, a unique distinction. He attended one of our workshops about five years ago uh, as a leadership team member, and then he became a coach. And so he has completely changed the paradigm. Again, it used to be wait till the process rock comes up. It won't go away. Call process optimizer. They'll fix it. And this is 10, 11, 12 months into the engagement by a coach. He now insists that his clients hire, uh, they get the help early. And he, he's really noticed that it just propels everything forward and it touches every part of the business. We try and not fly that flag, but our clients tell us, oh my gosh, it touches everything. And it really does. And when you get people thinking about process and you get them thinking about this thing, things just get better. Um, but again, it has to be in that environment where there's employee engagement, there's a willingness to contribute and a willingness to, to capture the stuff and move ahead. And, and back to Heidi's example, we have the empty chair at the table where you ask yourself, do we have an optimized process for that? Whatever it is you're talking about. And if the answer is no, then you got to go to work on that. Because until mm -hmm. you have an optimized process for that, whatever the issue, the rock, the to-do is on the table, it's not going to get better. You're just going to beat on each other, but you're never going to make it really go away. And you're going to fix the same thing over and over again. Right. 100% agree with you. So, any questions from the group? Josh, we got questions. Anybody on the call? Uh, this is Josh here. So, you can either type your questions in the QA chat uh, in the text, or you can raise your hand and I will allow you to speak. Um, I do have a question for, for Heidi and for Brett. Um, my question is when it comes to process optimization and really documenting everything clearly, um, how often do you hear from clients that are saying that it's really difficult to find a, um, a recruiting prospect or a candidate who is a good fit for that specific process? So I feel like sometimes it is nice to have that clarity when in terms of, you know, I know exactly the type of person that I'm looking for. Do you ever hear that people find trouble finding that exact type of person? Yeah, so I want to I, I want to answer, take that answer first. I tagged along with Heidi to South Bend, Indiana. Um, she was doing a workshop. It was last fall for a boutique investment group. And I was sitting through the HR uh, and hiring process. And one of the executives spoke up and he said, we have an unbelievable process here. We have a four interview process. We do all of these steps. He had all this documentation. And he said, I don't really think we need some help just clear, cleaning this up, making certain we're documented. But I don't think there's really any optimization or anything you can help us with. So Heidi starts asking some questions. And it was like, Four or five questions in, all of a sudden, the note taking, the, they're breaking keyboards, the questions coming up are remarkable because Heidi is prodding them and asking them. We put a big push on people. And so after 15 minutes of this, he said, if you'd have told me that we would imp have improved this process, because we are good at hiring, you've got to be, I think he said, you got to be blessed by the Pope in order to work here. But my gosh, this process, this, this exchange and this building, we just made it so much better. So there's always room for improvement. The answer is always there. It's usually right in front of you. But sometimes it takes an outside third party to stimulate that in the right environment. And so I witnessed this. So back to your question, um, they got some simplification out of this because I think they kind of started to go off the rails with this process and, and really were focusing on some indicators that weren't helping them. And the Q&A that, that Heidi facilitated brought them back around. Yet they, they, were, they were certain in their minds uh, that the thing was absolutely perfect. There was nothing left to improve. Can, can you build on that, Heidi? Heidi's done hundreds of workshops. I've watched a bunch. 
<laughs> so uh, I see what you're I saying is by by simplifying the process. Sometimes it's sort of like your credit terms. Let's say as a company, you get some bad debt and then you create some credit terms that are so ridiculous that you actually are driving your good customers away, right? You know, like I remember I was working with a guy and they were trying to buy a piece of property that he was a partner with me. And luckily I, I was majority partner or I controlled the boat. And he was like, yeah, we're not going to put that property under contract until the buyer gives us audited financials. And I was like, Okay, um, that doesn't happen in South Carolina. <laughs> but the thing is, so I can see what you were saying. Um, go ahead, Heidi, if you wanted to add something to the uh, the hiring. Yeah, I would just say, you know, what process does is it helps you beyond the job description, right? You know, we can come up with the job description, but to really illustrate what we're going to do, the high level steps that we've thought through that, we've got outcomes. We've got triggers to start the process, that this is how you fit into the process and how you fit into the whole. It can only enhance your screening and recruiting process uh, by having these processes in place, your playbooks. And, and, and all of that really is around driving behaviors. Mm -hmm. You can talk about this stuff all you want. At the end of the day, you've got to have behaviors that are going to capture the leading indicators and run the scorecard. That's what's going to get you to the finish line. Awesome. Well, I definitely appreciate you guys' time. It's very, very exciting to always hear from y'all. And um, you should be hearing from me soon. But um, we definitely appreciate you guys. Very informative. Um, I know we've had a, a few people on, but we also have many people wanted to get the recording. So we'll get that out. And thanks again, guys. Any last words for anyone? Yeah. Thanks, Mike. We really appreciate the opportunity. Our, our business is in existence because of the coaching and guide community and those referrals. It's a big deal around here. So anything we can do to support that, uh, the outcomes are always outstanding in working with people like you and people who are out there really trying to help people. It's it's, it's the way it is for us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, guys. Y'all have a great day. Thank appreciate you. You too, Mike.